Hey guys, this is Cody again here with Horizon. I'm joined with Jason Merkel. And uh, as you can see on the table, today we're going to talk about the E Flight 64mm uh, F 16 Falcon. Uh, recently released, it's been out for a while, but uh, we did want to go ahead and do a discussion video for you guys. Uh, just to give you some yeah. of the, the additional well, details on it. Some guys may have seen that we were, we did do a Facebook Live uh, that we discussed the F-16 in, yep. but then there was an issue with the files and it ended up, ha we had to pull it down. So yes. uh, a couple of guys were asking, hey, how come you guys didn't go back and do one or how come you, got, you guys didn't do one? And we did do one before, but we're coming back to do it again. And actually over the last couple of weeks, we've been monitoring some of the comments on this product in particular. And one of the questions that I saw come up a few times is how does it compare to its bigger brother, the 70 millimeter model? So, so uh, this time around, we're actually going to show you the comparison between the two because it's a pretty big jump. You know, it's a, uh, a pretty good jump in price, but also a pretty big jump in size and in uh, feature set. And so we'll talk about those here in a little bit. And then also the last time we did the video, we did have the F-15 64 millimeter in here uh, to compare to the F-16. That comparison, um, I think the, the biggest thing to mention in that is that the F-15 um, is still probably the easier to fly jet. Right. So this F-16 is not hard to fly, relatively speaking. It's probably the easiest to fly F-16 ducted fan model that's out there now, especially when you buy the Bind and Fly basic version and you have AS3X and then obviously optional use safe select. Uh, and if you're looking to fly, a, say an F-70 millimeter or a larger F-16 down the road, this is a great step. But I would still say your first jet of choice uh, would be either the F-15 64 millimeters, a great choice, phenomenal yep. flying airplane, super simple, super easy to fly, good power, good speed, looks great in the air, uh, and then the uh, Viper jet. So the Viper 70 millimeter is also a great first jet, honestly a perfect first jet. The difference between those two I would say is that the Viper is a full house jet, sure. it has retracts, yep. it has flaps. It's 6S, it's over 100 miles per hour. That's, if you really wanna go and get that full on jet experience in a, kind of the more complex full house way, yep. that's the way to do it. The F-15 is a simpler way to get into EDS. Lower cost, the airplane itself. Also, it runs on four cell 2200 batteries, just like this F-16, 64 does as well. And so that's good for a lot of guys. The uh, Viper requires a 6S, anywhere from a 3200 to a 4000, just like this F-16, 70 millimeter. And so again, for a first jet, we highly recommend that F-15, 64 millimeter, or the Viper, 70 millimeter. Uh, as a great follow-up to that, this F-16, sure. 64 millimeter is a great second choice uh, jet. Uh, if you've flown jets before, this will be no problem, of course, to fly. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it is a relatively simple airplane. It doesn't have retracts. It doesn't right. have uh, flaps. The full scale of 16s actually use flapper ons anyway. Uh, but that said, it's a simple model. It's low cost and it runs on batteries that most people already have. Right. So that's gonna, kind of a big deal. So you've flown this, um, this airplane before, and I think you flew it with the, the setup that we have now, which is the 4S setup, right? Right, so actually the earlier version, the generation one of this airplane, uh, actually was 3S compatible only. That's right. That's so right, yeah. um, I, can, I have flown this one as well, and let me tell you, the, the difference between the two is, is, is pretty big. Uh, 4S on this, you know, if you really wanted to, you could do a hand launch. Um, it may be a little difficult for some first time guys, but yeah. you could do a hand launch with 4S on this, the three cell iteration, you couldn't. Um, lots of power. This one, in my opinion, is a little easier to see. The decals on it are, yeah, are the trim awesome. Nice. The trim scheme is very cool, in my opinion. Um, modeled after the the, the actual uh, National Guard mm -hmm. version in Texas, so it's it's a very very neat trim scheme. Yeah, I like this. This was um, a 65th anniversary trim scheme for the Lone Star Gunfighter uh, group, and it is very visible in the air. That's yep. kind of the nice thing about it. The problem with the all gray of 16s a lot of times is once you get a little further out, it's hard to tell orientation right. on those. So we did not want to do a Thunderbird F-16 here again, even though honestly, and, and some guys will argue this, but you know, I've been in the industry a long time and we've seen sales numbers of these things. We've seen the comments. Uh, when F-16s are available in Thunderbird's library, they sell best. Right. So by far that's the most popular trim scheme. Even if it's not your favorite, I totally understand that. I grew up in, in Las Vegas and that's where um, the, F the, the Thunderbirds, of course, are, that's their home base. So I love the Thunderbirds and I own multiple sizes of Thunderbird F-16s. Um, and I would have loved to have this little guy in, F in the Thunderbird scheme as well, but I love this scheme. It's a great alternative. Again, good visibility and then also it's unique. Right. That's kind of the nice thing about yep. it. So, uh, and that brings up our first point. You mentioned the version one of this airplane, which is available for one of our partners. Um, it was a 3S compatible aircraft yep. and it flew okay. The performance was, you know, not bad, especially for its time some years ago. And nowadays, I think the performance expectation is much higher. Right. And for that reason, we upgraded to the 4S power system. It does have a, a 64 millimeter 11 blade fan, 40 amp ESC. 
Will it fly on 3S? A lot of guys ask that question. And I know I've seen people fly the F-15 with the same power system on 3S, and it flies, but it's not exciting. And you're basically flying it on the wing more than you are right. on the thrust. And so I think that takes some getting used to, and that's not for everyone. So right. that said, I, I wouldn't even try 3S, guys. I strongly recommend going straight to 4S, only flying it on 4S. Uh, all the way from say an 1800 on the low end will fit and work well, uh, but then on the higher end, probably not a lot more than say a 2200 because of weight. Right. And so the issue there is that the battery is all the way up in the nose, and the heavier your battery is, the more nose heavy you're going to end up being. And so if you use the battery that we recommend, the Spectrum 4S 2230C smart battery, this is a relatively lightweight 2200. A lot of guys are thinking 2200s are all created equal. They're not. There's sometimes as two or three ounces of difference in the weight of a four cell 2200 milliamp battery. And that's a whole lot of weight up here in front of the CG. So if you have a heavier 2200, especially a lot of the lower cost 2200s that are out there tend to be uh, the larger, heavier cells. Usually they're, you know, part of the, the, the kind of way lipo business works is sometimes you can just cram up, uh, you know, more capacity into a larger cell and then downrate it as a lower right. capacity cell and it works fine. And, and that's yeah. what some people do. And so for that reason, it's important to make sure you get a battery that's either the one we recommend or close to the weight that we recommend of the battery we, re we recommend. So that way your CG isn't way off. It right. will fly nose heavy. Uh, but that said, it doesn't fly as well, right. especially if you want to perform the high alpha stuff, sure. which F-16s are really phenomenal uh, when it comes to the high alpha um, flight cap uh, capabilities. So uh, again, it's a 64 millimeter fan, 11 blade, it's all installed for you. The fan is already bolted in. It's already been run up at the factory. It's got the ESC in there. It's got an EC3 connector, which is compatible with, of course, the very popular EC3 or also the new IC3 that comes on the smart batteries. Right. And uh, that basically makes it plug and play. We do have a plug and play version available yep. and also the Binafly Basic version. Both of them are the same. They have the power system installed. They have all the servos installed. The biggest difference, of course, is that the Binafly Basic version comes with the Spectrum AR636 receiver, which has AS3X pre-programmed, and then also the optional use Safe Select. Right. So some guys say, hey, I don't want Safe Select. I don't want that stuff in my, in my jets. I know how to fly. No problem. It's optional for a reason. Right. You can either not bind with it at all or bind with it on and put it on a switch so you sure. can turn it on and off. And so you mentioned hand launching. And I will say, even as an experienced pilot, Whenever you're hand launching something, uh, especially if there's a lot of wind and crosswind and whatnot, if right. you can't throw it directly into the wind, having safe on, it makes it, a, world's a difference. it makes it, it possible. Yeah. And then B, it makes it <laughs> relatively easy. And so even as an experienced pilot, all of our aircraft that I fly, I have them bound with safe select. Yep. I may never use safe select pretty much ever. But if anything bad was to happen, let's say I fly through the sun or, you know, there's a dog nipping at my heels or, uh, you know, I, I just lose orientation for a moment. I can flip safe on, it'll get the airplane back to level, and then I can go from there. And so it's a great tool to have easy, even as an experienced pilot. And of course, as an inexperienced pilot, if this is, uh, you know, your, say, second EDF model after, say, the F-15, having safe select on and off for takeoffs and landings with the landing gear or hand launching, uh, it makes it a lot easier. Keeps right. the wings level for you. Uh, it, with full throttle, you got a little bit of up elevator in there, so it's got a little bit of a climb to it. It makes it a lot easier to manage. So I do strongly recommend getting the Bind and Fly Basic version if you have a Spectrum transmitter. Uh, the difference in price is only twenty dollars. So right. the plug and play version is one fifty nine ninety nine, so one hundred sixty dollars US, and then the Bind and Fly Basic version again twenty dollars more at one seventy nine ninety nine. Right, that's a pretty good deal if you consider yes. this. The AR six thirty six receiver that's in there is actually it's eight, I think they're eighty dollars right now. Separately, eight dollars yeah. by itself. Mm -hmm. So the extra twenty bucks you get the receiver and it's already programmed and you got safe select. So yeah. it's really it's really the better bargain. It's, for it's sure. a great value and that is a six channel receiver, but it is not a six channel airplane right uh, so some guys have said it's a three channel airplane that's not exactly true it's it does have four channels so you've got aileron elevator and throttle control of course it does not have a rudder the 64 millimeter models this and the f-15 Yep. Uh, are, are built without rudders to keep them simple, to yep. keep the weight down, to keep the cost down, to keep the complexity down. Uh, you know, some guys say, oh, I have to have a rudder. You don't have to have a rudder to enjoy flying an airplane. I right. grew up flying a lot of three-channel airplanes, and you can fly with just ailerons. Or back in the day, I used to fly a lot of airplanes with just a rudder and no ailerons. Yep. I always wished I had ailerons. Uh, but that said, it's a lot of fun even without a rudder. It does, however, have a nose steering servo. So if you do have the landing gear on it, you do have a steerable nose wheel. Right. So that's where your fourth channel comes into play. And then if you buy the Binafly Basic version, 
you do have that fifth channel, you will need a fifth channel to actuate um, safe select if you right. do bind with that on. And so I do recommend, most guys are gonna have, of course, a six channel transmitter. So a DX6E or something along those lines is perfect for an airplane like this, has more than enough channels. The PMP airplane, in theory, you could fly it with a three channel or four channel radio. I don't know if anybody does that anymore, but um, most people, again, have a six channel transmitter and that's more than enough for uh, both the plug and play and also the bind and fly basic version. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, uh, I think you built the version one of this, and did that have the glue-on wings? So uh, the original had the glue-on wings. Mm -hmm. This one actually is, is requires two screws to hold yeah, the wings it's on. Nice. So there's a, it's a screw-on wing, um, very cool. Um, one thing that I want to touch on here with this particular airplane is that the ordnance on this aircraft. You can choose to run, yes. you can either glue it in place, or in this case, uh, I did a slight modification on this one here, and I actually rigged it with magnets. So I like the the ability to pull yeah. the ordnance off when I want to, and put it on when I want to show it off in front of a group of spectators. It or looks something. awesome so, with it on there, yeah. but I don't know if everybody realizes this. When you have it installed, it, it is extra drag. Sure. It is extra weight. It's not a lot of weight, but the big thing is drag, and so it slows the airplane down. Right. And then if you're hand launching and, and, and landing in grass, for example, you probably don't want to install the ordnance, or right. if you do install it, I do recommend using the magnets yeah. because then it will pop off in the event of a landing. In fact, some guys had asked specifically about the ventral fins. As you guys can see, F-16s have these ventrals down here. Uh, and if you are landing on grass, I would definitely either leave them off altogether, which yep. honestly, this airplane flies fine without them. You're not really gonna know a big difference uh, on this scale of model without the ventrals installed. Right. But if you can, use the magnets on those as well. Yep. I've seen a couple of guys already do that. So when they land, they you know knock off the ventrals, they go pick them up and they put them back on. So again, the magnet is, a, is an upgrade. It's an, it's an option. Uh, it's something that a lot of people have done on a lot of models for different reasons and you don't have to have the ordnance on there, I would say the difference in top speed is probably anywhere from five to 10 miles per hour with, so. with having it um, not installed. So if you want the most speed possible, maybe a little bit longer flight time, a little more efficient, you can go ahead and leave all the ordnance off, uh, the, the drop tanks off, and uh, go with the kind of clean setup, especially without the landing gear. In fact, without the landing gear, that's like another five to 10 miles per yeah. hour. So I've flown it both ways, with the gear and the ordnance, and then without the gear and without the ordnance, and it's significantly faster without everything on there. That said, it is no slouch with even all this stuff hanging off of there. On yeah. the 4S battery, it's got really good speed, really good vertical, and you mentioned about hand launching. With the 4S battery, hand launching is not hard at all. Yeah. And I know some guys struggle with hand launching, and I'll tell you, when I watch videos, I don't think a lot of people realize how they're throwing an airplane. A lot of times it's more like they're lobbing it. They're not throwing it. Yeah. You know, a proper hand launch is a lot like throwing a baseball, pitching yep. a baseball. It's, you know, arm extended out and throwing it into the yep. air, not lobbing it into the air, especially with the wing off to one side, the nose up, the nose down. It's throwing the airplane level under power. Right. And, you know, that way you can have a successful hand launch every time. Uh, and if you guys watch the F-15 video, uh, the, um, the the guys, the on-the-fly guys, Ali in particular, does a lot of crazy <laughs> hand launches with that one, partly yep. because it has the power and because it has safe. You can do right. a lot of the same stuff with the F-16. We haven't been able to do a video on that yet. It is coming. Um, <laughs> but that said, you can hand launch this airplane very easily as long as you don't make it a right. problem. And I, most of the launches that I've seen go bad are because the guy just didn't do a good hand launch. And so right. um, keep an eye out for that video down the road here uh, from the on the fly guys in particular. That's gonna be a lot of fun when we get to see that. Yes. And this is a lot again like the F-15. It's got good power and it does have safe. So it's easy to hand launch if you do it right. Right. Yeah. Yep. So what are some of the things that, that you found um, are good tips on this model for someone maybe that doesn't have a lot of EDF experience? So, um, I mean, you obviously want to start at a good runway. I would not, I mean, it, this airplane does not handle grass too well. In fact, I wouldn't really recommend a grass takeoff with this. It'd have to be like putting green. Yeah. It, with the landing gear. Very short, yeah. very short with the landing gear, of course. Um, for this airplane, I recommend having a really good long runway. Yeah. So you can have plenty of time, make course corrections as you're taking off. Um, get your speed up. It requires, you know, a, you know, full throttle to really get this airplane going. Um, and, and take off and safe select. Really, that feature really helps a lot of yes. users. If you're if you're trying to get into your first jet and an F-16 is really something that you're looking into, it's something that really meets your fancy, use the safe select feature because really you can get into an airplane like this with that feature. With banking limitations yes. and whatnot, it makes it extremely easy. Um, you know, it, it's also, in my opinion, it makes it more affordable too because but without safe select previously, <laughs> you'd take off, you get into a stall, you'd crash it, um, you lose the airplane. parts, yeah. You, or the you, plane, you, or and you lose plane. your confidence a little bit too right. and that makes you really feel like you can't, you know, actually take a jet under your own. So yeah. safe select is where it's at. That's the biggest feature. Fly with that, get your speed up, start off on, a, on actual runway and, and I really think you'll have success. It's, it's a great yeah, airplane. I agree with that point. I don't think, if this is your 
your first or second EDF model, or you know, it shouldn't be your first EDF model. I'm going to stress that again. Be a great second EDF model, and I do strongly recommend your first flights being with the landing gear installed, flying off of a paved surface. Right. Whether it's a runway at an RC field or you know a large you know parking lot, wherever you're able to fly, uh, that is probably the best way to learn to take off and land with this airplane. Right. Once you do that, you'll be able to more comfortably land on grass with the landing gear removed and probably more comfortably hand launch it as well. And yep. so again, we do recommend going and, and making those first takeoffs and landings on, on a uh, smooth surface. Right. In part, it could be dirt, you know, whatever you got. The smooth dry lake bed is where I learned how to fly back in the day. That's actually a pretty darn smooth surface. Uh, so that's good advice. Um, a couple of points we'll talk about on the assembly then. Uh, it does come out of the box pretty much all painted up. Uh, it has the wings bolt on. You yep. do have to glue the stabs on. This is an older design model, and so a lot of our new airplanes, things bolt together now. Yep. Unfortunately, we couldn't go back and change the stabs, um, and so you do have to use some CA or some epoxy or some foam tack right. to install the vertical fin, the horizontal stabs, uh, and then again, you have the option of installing the ordnance either with glue or you can buy some magnets and install it that way separately. Nose cone, I like this. One of my favorite features of both these F-16 models is it's a magnetic nose cone, yep. and that's nice because if you do have a hard landing, uh, it does usually pop off and it's not always damaged. If you yes. do damage it, it's very simple to replace. Just right. buy a new one and you can pop it on there. Yeah. Uh, so assembly is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. Probably yep. most people would get it done in the time it takes to charge a battery, yes. you know, like one or two C. Yep. So I think the vast majority of people um, can have it done in an hour right. or less, yeah. without a doubt. And then setting up the radio is super simple because it doesn't have retracts, it doesn't have flaps, it doesn't have even a rudder, it right. doesn't have some of those more complex features, uh, which again is why this model is the size it is and the price that it is. Because yep. some guys have said, why didn't you put retracts in it? Why didn't you Why didn't you put a rudder on it? Why didn't you do all those things would have driven the price up well over $200. And then this size model with all that extra weight on there would no longer be enjoyable to fly. Right. And so yep. that's another reason we brought the bigger brother today to show the difference in size. It is quite substantial. Uh, it's probably hard for you guys to see lengthwise the difference there. Um, but even though it's a 64 millimeter fan and a 70 millimeter fan, which doesn't sound like a big difference, the class of model is very, very, very different. We're talking many pounds of weight. Yep. Uh, we're talking a big difference in battery. The 64 millimeter flies again on a four cell, 1800 to 2200 milliamp battery. Yep. This 70 millimeter version requires a 6S, 3200 to 4000, which is right. not a common battery for a lot of guys. It's becoming a common battery for this size of aircraft. You know, 70 millimeter EDFs, even 80 millimeter EDFs. Also some of our like Carbon Z aircraft, for example, uh, the larger giant scale aircraft will fly on a 6S3200 to 4000. Um, and so that is a kind of a new battery buy for a lot of guys. Uh, the 4 cell 2200 is something most people already have. Right. So I can show you guys, kind of stick them here side by side a little bit. I can put that one up for you. So you can see it is a substantial difference. We kind of line up the, the tips of the nose there. It's, it's a pretty big size difference. Again, a big weight difference, yep. uh, big difference in, in power and performance. The 70 millimeter model, of course, does have retracts. It does have a rudder. It's a full house, more complex aircraft. Uh, and I'd say it still is not a, a good um, first EDF either. No. It is, it's a little bit more difficult to fly than the Viper. It's a little more difficult to fly than the F-15 64 millimeter, than also this F-16 64 millimeters. So this is a great model to aspire to and a lot of guys, this is a very popular airplane. It is, it We is. saw a lot of these, I, but I've seen even experienced pilots get bit by this. Yeah, sure. Uh, F-16s are very interesting in the way they fly. For anyone that's seen um, the Thunderbirds fly or full scale F-16 demos at air shows, you'll notice that they do the whole gamut. They've got the, they'll do the high speed flybys, but then when they're pulling in turns and they pull the high G turns, the airplane kind of skids through. And then of course they can do the high alpha flying. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the plan form of the airplane. And that's what makes the F-16 so unique. Uh, the way that it handles is different than some other jets that are out there. Not, not as different um, to the new jets as the older jets, you know, like a, an F-86 back in the day or an F-4 Phantom. Those airplanes were made to go fast and straight and there was no high alpha with those. Right. Um, now, of course, you watch an F-22 fly or an F-35 fly, even F-18, and those guys are doing high alpha a lot. And that's because of the plan form of the airplane. And also that was a, a, a type of of potential dogfighting that a person might have to do in one of those sure. aircraft. Um, but that's what makes the F-16 plan form unique and makes it a, kind of a learning curve. It flies a little different 
than your more traditional airplane. So when you yank on the stick, it kind of skids the tail down. Right. Um, whether it's in a, in a turn, tight turn, whether you're coming in on approach, it likes to keep the nose up, which I, is cool because you can do these really nice nose high, easy landings with F-16s yep. once you get yep. used to it. It just takes managing the throttle a little more. You know, some airplanes like even the 70 millimeter Viper, you can throttle it off on final and just kind of glide it down. Right. Keep the nose pointed down and then kind of flare at the last minute. F-16 is not exactly the same thing. When I watch guys, especially experienced guys, landing these F-16s for their first time, they're coming in a traditional fashion and with the nose down and I'm like, oh, they're gonna overshoot, oh, they're gonna overshoot, or they're gonna balloon. And sure enough, they pulled a flare and it gets the nose up and then they get into an oscillation or, or they go long on the, uh, on the landing and roll out off the end of the runway. So it takes some getting used to. That said, again, F-16s are not hard to fly they're just a little different to fly right and this 64 millimeter version is by far i've flown quite a few f-16 models over the years all the way from little ultra micro up to a giant scale turbine and this is the easiest to fly one period sure uh, especially with as3x and safe select in particular yep yeah so yep. i think it's a, it's a good one uh and then i don't know if anybody's asked this question but is it available now it is so yes. we've actually had these in the market for about a month now and the sales have really picked up yep. i think once people started getting them in their hands uh, they started to go, wow, this is a, a lot of fun for the sure. money, a lot of bang for the buck. It looks the part. Um, one of the benefits of the smaller 64 millimeter size versus say this 70 millimeter is you could potentially fly this at like a soccer field. Right. If you're a skilled enough pilot, I wouldn't recommend it if you're not a very skilled pilot, uh, but, and, and then you're allowed to fly. Not all parks allow you to fly, not all soccer fields, you can't fly over all of them. Right. So you wanna check your, your local rules or the rules of that particular park or sports complex. Uh, but this is a model you can fly there. I would not take this out to a soccer right. field and fly it. You could potentially in high alpha and go up high and do some some high speed passes, but you know this is almost like a park flyer to a degree. Sure. And so that's another reason for this class of model um, to exist and being simpler, smaller, less expensive. There's a, there's a lot of good reasons for this. So this again, readily available now, uh, available at your favorite local hobby shop, available online, your favorite online retailer, also available in Europe and the UK for those of our guys that are watching out there. Uh, and it's a very exciting model to add to the lineup as our, as our EDF lineup continues to grow. I think these guys are starting to realize when you start looking, we've got a couple of 64 millimeters, we've got a couple of 70s, we've got a couple of 80s. Can we go uh, higher from there? <laughs> you never know. You never know where we're going to go with things. Yeah. I'll say this. Keep <laughs> watching our website. Uh, we are not done with releasing new models. We're always releasing new models. We're not done releasing new jets. Yep. In yep. fact, there is maybe something coming somewhat soon-ish. Yep. Um, not like you know this class, these classes of models, but uh, we do have a lot to a lot of cool stuff still to come this year. So be sure yes. to keep an eye on our website. Uh, and then we do saw the ultra micro jets, which a lot of guys overlooked. The little sure. UMX MIG, the UMX A10, also yep. great um, kind of low time EDF pilots are are very happy with those models as well. Right. So. Uh, any other questions that have come up? So yeah, just to kind of show what we're doing over here, guys, we are taking your questions. If you have anything specific you'd like to know, we can answer your questions. Um, a gentleman on here wanted to know if what the average speed would you say it would, would go? Uh, you know, I don't know if we've put this one on the radar gun on the GPS. I would say having observed it fly and flown it myself, it's somewhere between 60 and 85 miles per hour, depending on the landing gear hanging off there, the ordnance hanging off of there. When it's all cleaned up, I'd say it's probably pushing that 80 to 85 miles per hour in level flight. Uh, and then with everything kind of hanging off of it, it's slower, probably closer for that 60 miles per hour, which doesn't sound particularly fast, but at this size, it's pretty quick. Well, also, if this is gonna be your first jet, you might be used to something that's prop driven that might be a little slower. Yeah. So 80 mile an hour might be pretty fast for some of those guys who first start or it's get not, into it, so. Not uncommon for a lot of, especially a lot of our prop airplanes now that are forest compatible to be in that 60, 80 mile per hour range. So people are kind of used to that speed. So this is, is very, very manageable. Uh, the 70 millimeter model, for those that are curious, is faster. It probably is well over 100 miles per hour. Right. Um, and we actually are gonna go out and do some speed runs and get some more speed uh, baselines for some of these uh, different EDFs here in the future. And um, yeah, there's definitely a speed difference. And sure. again, this is no slouch though, yeah. no slouch. Uh, Charbel would like to know if we would recommend this airplane for a beginner. Ah, so not a beginner airplane. As a person who's flown RC aircraft before, it could be a good second choice for a jet. Uh, but if you've never flown a rig controlled aircraft before, you do want to start with what we call a trainer. So in the E-Flight brand, this by the way is the E-Flight F-16 Falcon 64 millimeter. We also have the E-Flight Apprentice STS. That's a 
phenomenal trainer aircraft. Right. Um, it's a little bit larger aircraft, so you can fly it in more wind. It's easier to see uh, at, at further distances. We do have some smaller models also available in our Hobby Zone brand. So the Mini Apprentice, for example, is a little bit smaller version of the Apprentice. That's available in that brand. We also have the very new Aero Scout, yep. which everybody loves. So the Hobby Zone Aero Scout S. Hobby Zone Mini Apprentice or the E Flight Apprentice STS. Those are three probably my, my top recommendations for trainer aircraft, especially if you want to move up to these. We have some smaller trainer aircraft as well, but a lot of those use smaller controllers, smaller batteries, smaller chargers, and so you won't be able to reuse any of that for these models down the road. So I strongly recommend uh, those three models in particular if you're a first time pilot. Yes. So this is actually kind of a first time pilot question. Uh, Adam would like to know how do you land one of these? <laughs> so <laughs> Lots of practice to answer that question. I will say it's, that is one of the hardest things to, to answer um, because it's, it's a combination of, of watching it happen successfully a couple times and then feeling it yourself. Uh, and so it is something that you, if you've never flown before and you've never seen someone else land an aircraft before, I strongly recommend taking the time to go to an RC flying field or find where people in your area are flying radio controlled aircraft or watch plenty of videos on YouTube. And it's a combination of throttle, uh, of, of elevator inputs, and it's, there's a lot going on to land an airplane. By far, when you're flying radio-controlled aircraft, the hardest maneuver you have to perform is a landing. Is the landing. You know, takeoffs yes. are optional. Landings yeah. are absolutely <laughs> mandatory. It's up to you whether you get in the air or not, but you, one way or another, you're landing. One way or another, it's coming down, and just <laughs> so, as, if it's in one piece yeah, or not. <laughs> it's not something that I can recommend, um, obviously, just walk you through it, talk you through it. Right. One thing I will say, though, for those that aren't familiar with it, is we have our Real Flight RC Flight Simulator. Yes. That yep. is the best tool, hands down, if you've never flown a radio controlled aircraft, and let's say you're in an area where you don't have access to either a flying field where there's a club or other pilots out there to help you learn how to fly, uh, I would strongly recommend buying that simulator and spending many hours on there. We have, in the newest version of Real Flight 9, we have brand new virtual flight instructor training yep. lessons, which are based on the Apprentice STS model. We walk you through how you taxi it on the ground, how you take off, how you make circles in the air, do different maneuvers, and then also we walk you through landing. And all of our beginner aircraft, our trainer aircraft as we classify them, are equipped as our safe technology. Yep. Pretty much all of them. Some of the very small ones are not, but our safe technology has the uh, pitch angle limits, bank angle limits, so you can't get upside down and crash. And that's very nice. And when you let go of the stick, it goes back to level. Yep. So it keeps you from getting into a lot of trouble. And so there's a lot of things you need to do if you've never flown before, but first things first, Make sure if you don't have uh, access to help, I would definitely get the Real Flight Simulator. Yeah, it'll save you a lot of money. A lot of money. And, and it's, it's coming from experience. Yes, and it's and a it's lot of fun It's coming from too. experience. Um, Richard Ames wanted to know if there was any alternate decals in the box. No, there's not. So this trim scheme is a, a very specific trim scheme. We modeled it exactly the way that it comes. Now, there are guys who have already customized it, whether they've added paint or changed some of the decals out, added their pilot's name here or their own name here as the pilot. You can do that, or you can repaint the whole aircraft. That is not uncommon. Right. These guys use uh, anything from Krylon spray paint to uh, you know some different airbrush paints. So there's a lot of information out there on how to repaint a foam aircraft. This is EPO foam, by the way, guys. It's not EPS. So this is the more modern day kind of rubbery, uh, more durable foam that can accept aerosol spray can right. paint, for example, also regular CA, so on and so forth. Yep. So Caleb Hamilton wanted to know if these models have flaps. Ah, so a full scale F-16 does not have separate flaps from the ailerons. They will use flapperons on landing and uh, these do have separate servos. So in theory, you could program a radio to have flapperons. That said, we actually flew this larger F-16 with and without flapperons, and honestly, you just don't need them. Uh, it adds complexity that you don't necessarily gain a lot from. With F-16s in particular, you can have that high alpha approach on landing and come in very, very slow, and the flaps don't necessarily help significantly with that. So F-16 models, in, in most cases, even my large-scale turbine one that I fly, I don't use the flaps on it. I don't use flapperons. I just land it clean, so to speak. Right. Sure. So these models don't, but our other models do. For example, the Viper 70 millimeter does have flaps along with retracts as well. Sure, sure. Um, one of the most important questions, how much are they? PNP ah. and bottom fly. So the plug and play version is $159.99, so $160 US. Okay. The uh, bind and fly basic version with that AR636 receiver that has AS3X and safe select and is only $20 more. So $179.99, so $180 US. Um, the prices are a little different in Europe and the UK for different reasons, but uh, those are the prices in the US and North America.
Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions, guys? It looks like we're all caught up here. So oh, real quick. I, I know one thing that a lot of people ask about, and, sure. and maybe they didn't mention it here, though, is flight time. And so if you use the recommended 4-cell 2200 battery, uh, if you fly around at full throttle, you're only going to get maybe two and a half, three minutes. But a lot of, a lot of guys throttle back for part of the flight. They're going to get four and a half to five minutes. I've seen guys eke six and seven minutes out flying around at very low throttle settings. Sure. But I would say traditionally you're looking at, you know, four minutes, four to five minutes, give or take, for, right. for using um, kind of typical throttle management and flying with, say, a 4-cell 2200, and in our case here, the Spectrum Smart 30C battery is a, a great choice. Sure. A battery for that. So. Does it look right. like I see any other comments here and here? Like I said, guys, we are monitoring this. Uh, right after here, we'll be still looking at uh, answer some of these questions in the comments. Yep. If you have any other questions, leave them in there. Jason and I will be on there watching you guys, and uh, thanks for tuning in with us. We appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. Thank you.